first, I want to thank you all for the amazing uh, presentations that you have, and every one of you was amazing. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to do a fast commentary on both what Ms. Therese and also Mr. Uh, Sam, Sam, because your name is not in the thing. Yes, yes. Sorry. Um, because you were talking about the blog and you were talking about white helmets and uh, other, uh, as well, factions or other, if you want, phenomena that are very well known in the Western mainstream media. I can tell you that I am. I live in Lebanon and I teach in, in, in three different universities, two different universities that are not on the, this semester, but um, and I teach media studies. So basically, this is what we look for and this is what we do. But this is what not uh, this is what is not found in the Arabian media or known by the Arabian public. What I mean is when the White Helmets was all of fraud and there were uh, the video was on, on Netflix and then they were um, nominated for the Oscars, I asked my students who are media students who are senior year, who are the White Helmets? And there were crickets in the room. I went and asked my parents who supposedly watch the, uh, um, uh, every day the news at, at 8 p.m. for example in Beirut. Have you heard about the White Helmets? I was like, what are you talking about? Like, Have you heard? Mm. In our media, in our Arabic media, nothing at all. Yeah. This just speaks how much they are speaking to the Western uh, mm -hmm. audience. This is uh, number one. Number two, considering what Ms. Was, uh, Dr. Uh, Therese was, uh, was uh, talking about, especially in that blog in specific, if you really know how the I'm not take I'm not, I'm not going to take a right side or wrong side here. If you really know how the culture and the Arab world, especially in Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, <coughs> this area, treats uh, gays or lesbians, or if you know how they are treated, or how the society looks at them, you will understand that this is impossible to happen in in the Middle East, specifically in Syria and at times of war, and specifically in 2011. Now maybe it's 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 it can be accepted better than 2011. But that blog, this is the first time I ever hear about that blog, ever, right now, right here. Oh. And second thing is that it's impossible to have, especially my dad is a hero, oh, no. <laughs> Trust me, no. So that's what I want to say. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, guys. Um, great presentations all around, really enjoyed them all. <clears throat> um, but uh, through, through all you guys' analysis of like the propaganda and the media we're exposed to, uh, you know, given the overt complication of the crisis in Syria and the subsequent strong anti-government narrative painted by the Western government and its media platforms, do any of you foresee a realistic scenario wherein the Assad government could both win the war and remain in power while also being recognized as legitimate by the international community? Or has the West committed too greatly to its campaign of disinformation to ever allow the Syrian government to operate sovereignly? Do you feel as though at this point that merely knowing and exposing the truth is an ex exercise in futility and that recapturing the popular opinion of the Western public an impossibility? Yeah, yeah so a good question, also questions. Thank you. With respect to the first part, I, I will say exactly what President Saad has said over and over again. The only way for this war to be won is for the armed groups within Syria to stop being funded, stop being armed, um, and, and that is the only way that this will end, without a doubt. Because the Syrians won't fight as much as they make it out to, to be the Syrians are killing, their, they're not killing their people, they're fighting armed insurgents. If those insurgents are no longer armed, there is no war. So on the first point, I think President Assad is spot on with respect to the way that this can end. With respect to your second part of the question, um, the, the Western, um, I guess, change of attitude, I think, this is my opinion, I think we don't know because we quite clearly saw the Trump administration in one week change its tune twice. And what it will be next week, I don't know. Um, in the lead up to that, and I didn't say this in my presentation, but, but I can tell you now again, feel free to go and have a look for yourselves. Um, the Russians and the British, sorry, the Americans and the British have met with representatives from Turkey, Saudi Arabia, <coughs> and, um, uh, uh, sorry, uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, Turkey, and there was, uh, Jordan, sorry, the other one was Jordan. In the week that we saw the change of attitude from Mr. Trump, President Trump, 
on Syria. Um, <coughs> I think, I, and in terms of what we're doing, I think the more people that are awake to the truth, the better it is. Not just about Syria, but just for us as a society, as a society as a whole. You know? And we look at history, human history, and modern history. I think the more that people know what's going on, and are not uh, mass sheep to to the uh, propagandists, I think that is a great thing for our children, for our future generations, uh, to be free from and have our own minds and thoughts, etc. Uh, but as to that, I think the West can quite quickly and easily, from what we've seen, the way that they've been able to portray um, the Syrian government and the Syrian president in six years, I think in, in one year they'll, they'll be able to change a lot of, uh, a lot of uninformed people's opinions. You know, I don't want to call them sheep, but the people that don't really know what's going on. Um, but I mean, they, they, I mean, I don't, I don't say that in a derogatory way at all. I'm just I'm using it as, a, as an example. I mean, there's a shepherd and there's, there's sheep, right? And they, they're obviously the masters and they're, they're controlling um, what people hear and what they don't hear. And if they want, they can quite clearly steer the herd wherever they want to go. That's my opinion. I don't know if anybody has a, another thought. Uh, thank you. Um, I just wanted to comment on that. Is that um, uh, one impression um, one can get from from all these media um, studies? Of course, is that public opinion uh, can be, as our first speaker showed, heavily manipulated. Also, I assure you, it can turn on a dime. Um, and um, but precisely because um, it's a, a smart thing on these fantastic images. If a thing is a fiction, you can put the story in any direction that you like. Um, at the moment, um, the, there is some sort of push for war in international affairs, which is um, covered and alarming. Um, the United States is actually moving towards a very, very dangerous position because they're moving in two fronts. Absolutely. Um, General MacArthur did warn them all those years ago that America cannot win a land war in Asia, and they appear to want to, as I say, have hostilities in, on, on two fronts. Um, uh, so I think that um, if they lose interest in Syria, um, they will do so suddenly. Uh, but there are people pushing them not to lose interest in Syria. Um, Paul Antonopoulos' uh, talk yesterday on Turkey is very important on that. Turkey is a very big player here. And Turkey is making a push um, to be um, to, for, to regain its position as a power broker and a gateway to Europe. The weak point in the European Union, I would suggest, is Greece. We are going to hear uh, more about Greece um, uh, over the next year. It's a country that has been done over terribly and has strong cultural ties to Russia. Um, but uh, one fi final thing, of course, is this blowing up of the Korea crisis. Um, if, if the Korea crisis really blows, we're going to have to take on China. So all of a sudden you will get um, animal rights campaigners campaigning against the appalling treatment of dogs in China, etc. And if I see that a gay blogger has set up in Pyongyang, I'll know that it's not Korean, not Korean Russia. <laughs> I, I like to live in hope that um, if we educate people, they'll go out and educate people and they'll go out and educate people and then you can change people's views that way. And I believe just like everyone went against the Vietnam War and stopped the Vietnam War, this is my hope, that's what's going to happen in Syria. And that's why I really want everyone leaving here today, you've heard perspectives that the mainstream media doesn't give you. If each one of you goes out and talks to just one person, and that person goes out and talks to one person. Why can't we stop the war like we did in Vietnam? And I think when the media wants to, like if they have an agenda, they'll turn the war off Assad and they'll find somebody else. But then we can go to that and the more that you actually tell the truth, the truth can never be hidden. And just on your point about um, the weapons of mass destruction, yesterday I saw, I think it was Blair, apologising, saying there's no evidence that it, well, that was. It was like a two-minute apology. Well, I'm sure the Iraqis are very happy to hear that one million dead. Thanks very much. But anyway, the point is the truth can't ever be hidden. And so we go out now and we share those. I've already had a lot of people who, you know, call me Assadist. I'm not even Syrian, but whatever. Yeah. You know, they go out and they say, you, you know, you're pro-Assad, pro blah, blah, blah. But over the last couple of days, there's been so much just... They're contradictions in the story. The people have been coming to me going, tell us where to go to find the truth. And I think that's really important because two weeks ago they weren't willing to even know that there was another story. So I think the more that they talk, the more they contradict themselves and the more people will wake up. That's my hope. Um, also on that point about um, the 
sense of futility about educating people. And I know, because I felt, especially part of the younger generation, I do also sometimes feel a lot of hopelessness in trying to um, engage when my friends ask me, what does this um, hashtag, uh, hashtag mean? What is happening in Aleppo? It's hard not to feel like a conspiracy theorist, and that's my honest opinion. But on behalf, and I hope I can speak from what my cousins have told me, on behalf of the Syrian people, um, victory um, is not about the president. It's not about, obviously, there's a lot of reconciliation to do, and about the question are we too deep into this propaganda war to ever um, go back to being normal? Um, Victory is not about Syrian people do, are disillusioned by Western media. We, we don't care what Western media think. Um, victory is the acknowledgement of the right of the Syrian people to determine their own fate. That's that's what victory is. Uh, what is Aleppo? Sorry, I just had to say. That. Um, <laughs> Okay, uh, a comment and a question, um, but before I just say that, I just want to say what an amazing panel of speakers. I was really amazed at the quality of all four presentations in this session. It really seems like the organizers left the best for last. Okay, so my first comment is for Therese, um, regarding Oday. Um, I just, yeah. as someone of Iraqi background, yeah. uh, make no mistake, Uday was a murderer. Uh, look, Jumana Hanna may have been a liar. She may have fabricated a, uh, fabricated a story in order to achieve fame or, you know, some other form of what have you. But Uday was a criminal. Uh, after the fall of the Saddam Hussein regime in 2003, videos emerged of Oday feeding people to his lions, his pet lions. There were videos of Oday engaging in certain... They were all circulated on video CDs in Baghdad and sold. And I have friends that knew of this and had you know, friends that actually bought them and watched them. So, apart from that, even before the toppling of Saddam in, in 2003, there were people that had emerged with stories saying that they were used as doubles for Oday, or they were um, his private bodyguards and witnessed a lot of the stuff that he had done. And yes, he was a, a, a racist. He did rape women. My cousin, my first cousin, was on the Iraqi national women's handball team, and she lived in the Olympic village in Baghdad, where Oday lived, and she witnessed a lot of these things, and she told them to me after she migrated to Australia in 2003. Okay, she actually told me when I first met her in Syria in 2002. Okay, so please, uh, I, I just wanted to correct that. Okay, as an Assyrian myself, um, and Jumana having been an Assyrian, I know that in, within our community, even before Saddam was toppled, there were stories going around, and I can't verify them obviously, but stories going around that Oday would force himself into Assyrian social clubs in Baghdad to have his choice of women that he would take and rape for that night. So, no, Oday was a rapist, he was a criminal, he was a terrible human being, and he deserved to die. Now, without a trial, he was a monster. He was a monster. Uh, so my, my question now is for the whole panel and even maybe open it up to everybody else. We've been talking about Syria for the past two days and what's happening in Syria and most of us seem to know the truth, most of us seem to have cottoned on to what's actually going on which is not being reported in the mainstream uh, media. What next? What can we do as a collective to raise our voices and make our voices heard and get the rest of Australian society from the grassroots level understanding our message and understanding what's really going on in Syria. <coughs> and that was my question. Uh, yes, good point. So I just have to agree on that last point there. I, as a man of the law, it's got to be done with the trial. <laughs> I'm, I'm certain he would have been found guilty anyway. <laughs> but 
but um, but that's that's part of what I spoke about is being fair and being yeah. just yeah. and the process being fair and just. If we expect that for ourselves, we should expect that for others as well. Um, but I agree. I mean, I'm, I don't dispute <coughs> about, uh, all day or or Saddam or anything like that. You know? And uh, as I said, I believe the outcome would be the same. Anyway. Um, with respect to what we can do, I think things like this, this, this conference, um, you know, uh, I know there's rallies all the time and I know there's different groups out there that do different things. What I think, um, uh, for me personally, I think there probably needs to be a unification a little bit more of some of these groups, um, you know, and, and having a larger voice instead of lots of little voices. Uh, that's just my opinion. Um, but I think um, uh, there was a good point made earlier on and, and that's, the more of us that can speak and have intelligent, logical, reasonable conversations with people that are like-minded about these issues, yeah. I think slowly, slowly we can turn that tide as well. You know, and I think, um, uh, I mean, I don't want to say the onus is on us, but, um, <coughs> but for the people that are passionate about Syria, um, <coughs> that can uh, propagate um, the truth, um, then, then I call upon them to do that in every instance that they can. You know, everyone um, has a responsibility. To ev absolutely. Everybody. You know, it's it's a, it's a, at the end of the day, put Syria aside, and this is what I was, this is what I'm, I tried to say. I think in, in, in what I presented as well, this is not just a Syria issue. It's a human rights. Uh, it's a global issue where we're human beings. You know, and and the concept of justice. And I think you you touched on this. Right? What is legally right sometimes, and what is morally right can be two different things. Mm. All right. Our morals should not be dictated by the United States whatsoever. Absolutely not. All right? and the Australian foreign policy, as an Australian first and foremost, I was born in Syria and I am Syrian by heritage, but as an Australian, I am very vocal about our government forming its own foreign policy agenda and not yes. following the United States blindly into every conflict. Every conflict that exists in the world today. But every conflict that exists today in the world, in my mind, and I'll go on the record and say this, is a result of a failed US foreign policy. If you look at North Korea today, they won't tell you this, and, and this is a side issue, but I'll just quickly touch on it. Right? It was the Americans in 1958 who first broke the Korean armistice agreement by trying to arm the South. It was the Americans, not the North and not China. When the North became aware of the US plans to arm the South with nuclear weapons, they then made it their policy to go and get nuclear with the aid of its allies, etc. We are in this position because of a Republican president called Eisenhower. And that's the truth, but they won't tell you that. Every failed foreign policy, US foreign policy, leads to more disaster. It happened in Iraq, it happened in Libya, it's happening in Syria, it's going to happen in North Korea, potentially. Um, but we need to be out there, and, and this isn't just about Syria, this is about people knowing what's going on and letting other people know what's going on as well. That's just my thing. The crux, the, the crux of my question was how can we coordinate our efforts in yeah, order I, to be I, more so effective? I, I think we need to come together That's collectively all. as opposed to just, you know... I, I don't want to cut short the questions and answers of our speakers. I agree it's a wonderful panel. But I just want to say that I foreshadow a short session at the end here where we might discuss what Nicholas is talking about now and perhaps some resolutions, you know, just to say that that's coming a little bit later, but let's not uh, uh, foreshorten the questions of our panel. I just wanted to make a really good point. Thank you. Just on the point that this isn't just about Syria, there was a problem that, I mean, one of, a lot of the articles that I was analysing, they were giving other examples of the United States breaking international law and intervening and they were saying, see, we've done it before. That makes zero legal sense. It's like getting a thief and him going, well, I've already stolen five times from the store, so what's the problem there? It's a complete legal fallacy. And I think one of the things that we have to do, I don't know, maybe the legal sort of aspect of it, is to look at the legality of what they're doing because it's completely illegal. And it's not even a, um, by Congress. Like, Congress hasn't even said that they should go. So it's illegal on an international legal level and it's illegal on an American domestic level. It's just illegal on everything. But the more we accept it, the more that they take it, that it's fine. And it's, what's, who's next? I'm Egyptian, and we had the Palm Sunday bombing, and there were talks, there was a rumour, and I, in my personal opinion, I think it was on purpose, but there was a rumour that was saying, well, if ISIS is in Egypt, doesn't that give pretext to bomb Egypt and intervene in the same way? If we let them get Syria, 
they're going to go to every country, and every country is going to be under the same pretext. ISIS, well, ISIS was in Sydney, wasn't it? So does that mean they're going to come and bomb Sydney? You can't let them get away with that legal fallacy because then everyone is going to be under that. So, I mean, I think there's a legal part of it, and like you said, a unification of our voices, but I definitely don't have the answer, but that's just the thought. Just quickly about um, what can we do from here in terms of unification. Um, it's important to distinguish between two parts of educating about conflicts or um, current affairs in the world. Not everyone wants to be an expert on Syria. Not everyone cares as much as we do, obviously. Uh, but it's important to um, separate educating about the conflict, which obviously is a very important thing to do, and giving people the tools um, so that they can on their own analyse what um, what the media is projecting, so what, whatever conflict arises in the world, they um, are questioning things and um, yes, they're just giving them the tools to... Um, yeah. um, my name is Fahad, I describe myself as a professional homosexual, and my question is for uh, Dr. Taylor. Um, I, uh, I think I may have I don't know if I got this perfectly correct, but I think you mentioned that some uh, Syrian gay activists sort of clued in one of the investigators onto the identity of uh, the gay girl in Damascus. My question to you is, um, what would you be able to say anything um, about the uh, sort of those the gay community within Syria and what their perspective is on the conflict? Because um, I know, for example, um, how uh, gay identity is weaponized in the context of Palestine, with Palestinian gays saying. The, the occupation is our first problem, not homophobia. I wonder if there's a similar dynamic in Syria. Thank you, yes, um, excellent questions there. Um, and um, uh, many of us are familiar with the whole um, washing of the Israeli occupation, um, where a totally spurious notion that um, gay Palestinians ought to be um, glad that the Israelis are there um, that it in some ways uh, might um, eventually advance their status or something. Um, yes, um, I, I don't have any um, first-hand knowledge um, of the Syrian gay community um, except what is filtered through the observations of others. Um, the ones that communicated their doubts to journalists about the um, identity of Amina, most interestingly is this, they were very afraid to do so. Um, they tried to take advantage of anonymous forums such as Twitter private messages and erase them afterwards, making special accounts to do so. Um, and the atmosphere of fear around that story is quite interesting, and I think that that goes back to um, the basis of the hoax, um, which, as I say, the intelligence agency is not too far away from that. And I must say, um, on a slightly different thing, on my own work on, on um, Burned Alive uh, by Suada, this French uh, Swiss hoax yeah. is that you can, in two steps, you get in contact with some pretty scary people um, with these. I think that um, gay activists in Syria have been very disillusioned um, by a lot of the, the rhetoric around Syria. Damascus is very proud of its old and long urban culture, and um, uh, people of all sorts of identities um, have a life in the city uh, which is being squeezed and very nearly destroyed by the current crisis. Um, and respect for their rights is so totally different from the fraudulent voice of this blog. It's, it's night to day. It's a masquerade, an inversion. It's, it's really quite interesting in those terms. But yes, um, uh, the two things about um, from the Syrian gay community is fear and silencing, um, which are getting, uh, which uh, from 2011 till today appear to be um, a really profound problems getting worse. I don't know enough of you now. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I just don't know. Maybe someone else does. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I come from Damascus. Yeah. 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 I don't know. Yeah. 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 Sorry, I don't want to comment on uh, you come from because Damascus. I don't know enough about yeah. well, the gay community. In I'm, I'm from Australia as well. But I was born in Damascus, so I lived in Damascus. Um, sorry to take over. <laughs> yeah. um, well, first of all, with the secular government of Syria, the number one thing you should know is this um, homosexuality isn't a rest an arrestable thing. Like people can be homosexual. There are ho like gay nightclubs in Damascus. Oh, I know of one at least. <laughs> um, there's like I know of 
people in Syria who are gay, and the any society like any pressure on homosexuals doesn't come from the government. It comes from society, and um, society can be. Um, it's definitely not in the place that the West is in now. Maybe it's about twenty years behind. But even back in my mom's teenage days, she would tell me that there was a, a local, very flamboyant, homosexual man on the streets of Damascus that everybody loved, and his name was Tutu, and he would wear, <laughs> he would wear like makeup on women's clothes and catcall, like all the soldiers would catcall to him. <laughs> so, <laughs> and there was no, there was nothing that um, happened to this man. Okay, maybe it's not as like. Uh, you, you know, there's gay parades in the street as it is in Australia, but certainly the homosexuals were being thrown off um, buildings like they are in ISIS. Do you think that they support the government over the like? Uh, no matter, I would say that it's an existential threat oh, for them. Yes. Yeah, so <laughs> I would imagine, I mean, I don't know, but I would imagine that they wouldn't want to live under the Islamic State or Al Qaeda. So <laughs> that's, that's all I have to say. Good day, it's now I'm Scott, District Grassroots, Average Australian. I've come 800 Ks to come and see this. <laughs> We, uh, you know, she'll be right, fair to go. Well, that's all out the window now, and we get that picture, right? Now, when I was a kid, TV used to have ads on TV. Now, I remember distinctly my uncles and aunties and that saying certain ads were taken off the TV because people were going into trances and being hypnotised. Some even ended up in hospital. So I get the, um, I've got no time for media whatsoever. I think the only time they say anything that's real it's the day after and it's in everyone's face and they've got no option but to say, oh, well, this happened, you know what I mean? Yeah. Now, the biggest thing about this that I find really aggravating is that a lot of the education in this country has been taken out, you know what I mean? They've been dumbed down, they don't know the facts, and you've got a lot of people running around with a lot of hot air going off about this, going off about that, and they're very uninformed, you know what I mean? Like, and, it's the old concept, divide and conquer. I mean, that's been around since Moses was a pup, so to speak. You know, like, and another thing I'll say is, um, right, our, our leaders in the world these days, right, I call them the puppets, right? They're controlled by the puppet masters, if you should, if that's the term I can use. It's like, well, who funded Hillary Clinton? They say George Soros was throwing money in there. Um, the Rockefellers, Rockchilds, the Mooses. Saudis. There's, there's like 13 or more than families that run the banks. The banks run the world. The banks fund the wars. These political people are sitting there with a gun to their head because if you don't go and fight this war so we can make bombs and all this crap, we ain't going to make money. So, oh, I like Tony Abbott, he, he wanted nothing to do with whatever it was here, so we'll ask all him. Exactly. And we'll get, you know, like, the same happened with Gillard and Rudd and all this. This country's, I'm telling you, I'm shattered because my grandfather, three of my great uncles fought in the wars, right? Now, even they had a bad opinion of why, you know, they never had the right message trade to them while they went, right? It's shattered, you know, like, and um, the thing that really gets me is, oh, I'm losing the block here. You feel the trade. That's right. Yeah, it's, it's, it's very dangerous. Yeah, it's, 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 so, it's so aggravating to see, as the term you used before, we call them sheeple, right? right? There's that many of them out there. And, and the only reason they like it is because, as I said, they're not given the right input in schools and whatever, right? And they think everything's okay, it's not okay. You know, like, this word racist, I think it's got no foundation whatsoever. There's only one race, and that's a human bloody race. <laughs> right? Yeah, I'll get to my point, I'll just 
remember. <laughs> <laughs> the question is, right, now these puppet masters, they fund everything, they control everything through the money, they even make money off shit with them, 400 billion there to bail out this country. Right? <laughs> if we take them out, do you reckon that's possible? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I completely, 100%, 1,000% agree with you, and there's more of us than there is of them. Yeah. Soros, Rothschild, all those, way, way more. They can only do as much as we let them do. 100% with you, and everything is so But <laughs> The only point I want to add is, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but I just want to make this point. <laughs> there's only three independent banks in the world that are not governed by a reserve bank system, or three countries that follow an independent <laughs> Yeah, does anyone know they are? Russia, China, Iran. And, and well, Syria falls under that as well, but then I urge you then to go and look at what's called the axis of evil. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, I just want to make that point. The, the, the economies are not in line with Western capitalist economies, and the last time I spoke at a forum like this, I actually spoke about an ideological warfare between, I guess, a socialist <laughs> idea and a capitalist <coughs> idea, etc. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to make that point. Independent banks, access to evil, line them up and see if they fit. That's, that's just all I want to say. Uh, next question. Um, there's also worth noting that the three countries that wanted to denominate oil sales out of US dollars was uh, Iraq, Venezuela and Libya. But what I wanted the microphone for was to answer the fellow with the blue beanie on, can Syria win and survive as an entity? Well, I draw the answer from the heroic struggle in Vietnam, right, where they've actually won the war and actually kept their country intact as a, as a sovereign state, and I hope Syria can emulate that. I just want to share one other thing. The American relationship with gas, with poisonous gas, most people aren't aware, but it's a historical fact. In 1943, when the Americans were invading southern Italy, they brought a whole transport ship full of mustard gas up to use on the nasty Germans, presumably, but the Germans got wind of it and blew the boat up in the Binney Harbour. About a thousand people died as a result of that, and unfortunately, when the American military surgeons did post-mortems, they saw the loss of bone marrow and lymphoid tissue, and that was actually how chemotherapy got its start. <laughs> Uh, to me, the uh, American argument is so specious and so easy to see through. And why I say that is because they, su they are supporting moderate rebels. Can't journalists uh, put them on the spot and say, who are the moderate rebels? Yeah. What is their program? How do they differ from ISIS, Al-Qaeda and the rest? What are their plans for we did, Syria? We did. Every time I call any organization, any mainstream media, to take questions, any politician to ask him, they will say, we will answer back at you and no one even returns an email or a phone call. Never ever. Any question that we ask from any mainstream media or any politician, especially Western politicians, they say, uh, we will get back to you, we're a bit busy, and then no answer. <laughs> no, I, I think a major problem with that is the people that do speak out and ask the questions, and I think there's a really good video, look her up, Eva Bartlett from the United yeah. Nations, yes. yeah. um, where she calls them out. Anybody that speaks up, and there's a comment made here before, becomes an apologist, becomes some false sort of a, a pro-regime, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, spokesperson or whatever it is. I'm not, if, if asking for the truth and wanting to know what's going on makes me pro Assad or pro, mm -hmm. call me whatever you want. I don't care. Yeah. But don't lie to me. That's 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 what I, that's what I'm trying to say. But um, but that's the problem. That's the issue. When you speak up, uh, the masses attack. You know, they like a pack of wolves. <laughs> you know, they they you know? Well, there's a journalist called Charmin Narwani, and she actually wrote a article titled "Who Are the Moderate Rebels?" and she posed that question to Robert Ford. Uh, which was the uh, ex-ambassador to Syria, the US ambassador to Syria, um, they got no answer. However, the CIA produced a list of uh, 
what do they call them, like vested, vested groups that they would be willing to give arms to. And on that list was Noor al Zinki, which ended up beheading a 12 year old boy. So, um, when their crisis of naming the moderate rebels is that those moderate rebels they name would end up committing a war crime, and that is exactly what happened when they tried to name them. So. I, the, in my, I just thought, last one more point on that. There are, there are, to me, there's no such thing as a moderate rebel. No. Right? Yeah. If, if any single person in Australia picked up arms and went to war with the Australian government or the Australian security forces, would we call that person a terrorist or a moderate, uh, moderate rebel? Terrorist. Terrorist. Hundred percent. There is no question about it. There is no such thing as a moderate rebel. If you pick up, there may be moderate opposition. That's a difference. There may be people who oppose the government politically. That's there's no issue. But if you pick up arms and you fight against a sovereign state, you're not a moderate. That's, that's, that's in my, that's, there's no definition, I think, in the world that, that, that you can put them under and call them a uh, moderate. Absolutely not. Yeah. Yeah, it's fair to say there's no such thing as a sovereign state name or there's only corporate entities. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm not an expert in that stuff, in that, in that area, to be honest. Well, well, <laughs> <laughs> I can't answer that. Um, yes, in, in answer um, to Bernie's point, um, it is ridiculous um, that this question is not being um, formally posed by journalists in their interviews, um, except in minority um, news stations, um, specifically of an opposition um, stance. Um, and um, it also, the media dances around the, the simple fact, um, what you're saying, it is the right of every sovereign government to put down an armed rebellion. It's one of the things that makes a government a government. Mm -hmm. And if we um, uh, disallow that, then we should be prepared to just see um, some foreign entrants come in and, and occupy the Pilbara, because yeah. that should surely be cheaper than uh, buying a stock office. That, and that would too. But there is this whole I idea, um, as a speaker, but it's very, very dangerous. Um, to every sovereign state, this notion that uh, if your neighbours don't, don't quite like the size of your state, they, they'll, they'll cut it into a different shape. Yeah. Just following up on that, um, on the 23rd of August 1770, Lieutenant James Cook on Possession Island claimed the, the uh, New South Wales up until the high tide mark, not including areas claimed by the Dutch. At no stage, other than the constitution where they said no one lived here or they're all dead or hiding, incognito, um, did we claim sovereignty. In other words, it still lies with the Aboriginals who evolved here. When they had the Treaty of Jerusalem in the Crusades, the East Hemisphere was given to um, the Caliph of Damascus, basically, who was who was a Persian at the time, I think, um, and that, well, except for the treaty between the, the the two popes last year in Cuba, where they've superseded that, basically by default, if you said that the Aboriginals were just interlopers, that would basically make Australia Syrian sovereignty. Oh. Yes, yes, the, the sovereign shape of any nation um, uh, could be challenged by this. If anybody gets um, a, go, a regime change going thing against Australia, which is not inconceivable, I think that the people of Libya thought it was inconceivable what would happen to them, um, they would uh, definitely use the indigenous um, issue, which is a real issue, as leverage, <laughs> and a long coastline um, and uh, remote areas would, make, would put us in a very challenging position. And... Uh, Yes, uh, and everybody should be concerned about this because um, this is the shape of the modern world. I think like, a lady of them is yeah. wishing if you could uh, speak, yes. Okay. Sorry, I don't really need a microphone. Um, okay, it was a follow-up question from the guy over there who's now gone. Um, to you, Teresa, about the response of the Syrian um, gay community. What, what was the response once this evidence started surfacing of the blog being a hoax, what were the response of the international gay community, like the Australian gay community, American, European, whatever? Was there um, one? 
very little formal um, response. Um, uh, mainly, um, uh, some prominent individuals were interviewed for documentaries, um, and they uh, tended to um, stress a rather vague solidarity with the Syrian people. And they constantly got onto this um, thing that uh, fake voices like this prevented us from hearing the real voices. Um, without any discernment as to what the real voice might tell us, um, because in fact I think that they, um, uh, the gay community were very much caught on the back foot by this, um, and it's most especially um, uh, um, uh, women's groups um, who'd been um, accessing online communities. Um, which turned out to be covertly run by these weird men, <laughs> I guess, um, and imposing it entirely. And uh, the um, the documentary that's been made about that um, goes into a lot about the, the individual disillusionment. But they did not um, basically get beyond a individualist and a cultural stance, and perhaps understandably did not want to get into Syrian politics. Right. Yeah. Hi. Um, I just wanted to correct something that you may not have intended to say before regarding RT. I think it's really important that it happens to be part of the US narrative to dismiss RT as a vehicle for Russian propaganda. And I just want to quickly uh, put to rest that and, and when somebody asks what should you do, where, where do we do, where do we go, and, and one of the things I would implore you to do is to watch RT. Yeah. Yeah. On RT... Despite yeah. what RT is, I'm sure some people really don't know what it is. Okay, Russia Today. It's a, a TV program. And the reason why is there's probably only one or two programs on there, Sputnik and Crosstalk, that could be considered as anything to do with propaganda, particularly their discussion programs. There's the headline news, we have someone here who's, who's been interviewed on RT, but there are a, a very highly respected American identities on there that have programs. Uh, Tom Hartman has the big picture. Larry King from CNN was on there. Ed Schultz. There's a legal program with Mike Papatino. These are really independent programs. You should go and see them. There are other programs going underground. Um, which deals with British issues and has people from all sides of politics there. Um, Watching the Hawks by Tyrrell Ventura. His father was the governor of, uh, of uh, California, uh, an ex-professional wrestler. So I would say ignore the narrative that the US government want to do and put out to you and they announce it all the time. Go and check out RT. I promise you, you'll, be, you'll really appreciate it. I just want to, I just want to uh, mention, uh, uh, just beware to watch the RT in Arabic. The RT in Arabic is belong to, to uh, Saudi Arabia. It's not RT, it's not a For those who don't know, it's, uh, you know, I don't know, if we were to go out and call something GNN or something and make it similar with the weather. Yeah, they, they, they were very clever in owning the RT Arabic. Uh, right, so. Yeah, uh, just quickly to, to make a, a point before I ask a question, because uh, the truth can be a very slippery concept. Firstly, uh, Jesse Ventura is the father of the gentleman mentioned in Washington, the Hawks, was actually the governor of Minnesota, not California. Witness for the prosecution was not a film by Alfred Hitchcock, it was a film by uh, Billy Wilder, who was actually a published Jew. You're thinking of the Paradigm case that was directed by Alfred Hitchcock that had Charles Lawton in both pictures. But the only reason I mention that is to show you how easily the truth can actually not be the truth, and little things can slip out and eventually accumulate to create a different iteration of the truth. Um, I just wanted to basically put two things to you. I mentioned briefly a question yesterday. The, uh, the undermining influence of the patronage system in so many Middle Eastern states I think is a huge issue because it undermines the ability for true unification and creates these resentments that uh, allow these fault lines along religious and sectarian lines to develop. So I just wanted firstly, um, if you wanted, could, could address that. And secondly, 
Uh, I'd also like to thank Tim and all the other people who organised this conference. It's a wonderful thing that all these ideas have been aired, and I think a lot of broadening of understanding and perception, even though people might not necessarily agree with each other, at least they've come to a great understanding. I think it's great. I think the next one you should organise, Tim, should be on Yemen, because that's something that hasn't really been talked about at all. And it's, it, you'll need a he hegemonic conference in the first place to create the orthodox if you have the counter hegemony, because very few people know anything in, uh, in the wider community about Yemen. It's barely mentioned in the media, and I think it's developing to be just as great a tragedy, maybe even a greater tragedy than, than Syria. So I just wondered if you uh, wanted to comment on how Yemen fits into the, the situation. Firstly, I'd like to thank all of the, all of the speakers from this session for giving such, such fine, if you want, presentations. Secondly, yeah. yeah. I would like to suggest that you listen to what Jay has to say. I'm going to be very quick. So, this Sunday, 1.30 at Martin Place, we have a rally. Uh, no war against Syria. Um, the details are up on the on the Eventbrite Facebook page. So just go to the Facebook page, and there's two of them actually, and you should be able to find it. Hit attending. Come along if you can. Um, I just want to wrap up a little bit. Um, uh, first of all, because a number of people have said, what is the follow up? To the conference and let me just say what we've actually have done and are planning to do. First of all, I didn't just organise this conference. It came out of Hands Off Syria and Hands Off Syria delegated four of us, Jay Tharapel, um, Paul Antonopoulos and Drew Cottle to organise this. So really the four, four academics. <laughs> Not just with the presenters, some remarkable presenters, particularly the young people. It's really encouraging to see young people come up with such confident, strong presentations. But the audience, the audience has just been so fantastic these last two days. It's been very hard to end each of these sorts of sessions because there's been such intelligent responses and commentaries and so on. And that just tells me that we all have a voice. So what we can do here, you know, we're not, we're not Mujahideen, we're not going to go and resolve these wars in the Middle East. But we do have a voice and we shouldn't undervalue that. So let me tell you what we've organised so far. First of all, the conference and that we've all had the experience of the last two days. Second, where um, uh, Gemma and Stella have been video and taping this entire conference. Session by session, including the question times. You notice Stella's following tracking around people asking questions. We're going to put that up progressively on YouTube. If you have some particular problem with yourself being on YouTube, please let us know and we'll, we'll deal with that basically. But that's the next step we've got. Uh, thirdly, we do have this as an academic conference where you know it's a little bit of bait to attract in people who are students and researchers and academics because we have, well, there is a website that's allied to our interests called Centre for Counter Hegemonic Studies which is dealing with these sorts of things to do with self-determination of peoples and anti-imperialism and we're going to publish refereed, academically refereed papers from any of the presenters who want to uh, submit their papers for, for refereeing. And that matters for something if you want to be a writer or a researcher or an academic, basically. So that's what's already there. Now, it's been suggested we might, and there's a rally that, that Jay mentioned also, it's been suggested we might make perhaps some resolutions of the conference. Um, I've got some ideas about that, but I think it would be good to hear from other people what are the ways we might use our voice in, in some useful way. Do people would like to make some suggestions? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'd uh, just, just like to, um, I suppose, uh, follow up on how we, I suppose, plan to, uh, to organise. It's all right, like, largely the groups here, I imagine that you, you're preaching to the, to the choir. Um, we at least are semi-aware of um, a certain amount of issues to, uh, specifically to do uh, with Syria. And, uh, and just and particularly when uh, we, say for, uh, myself, for example, when I'm trying to engage with uh, uh, some, particularly on social media, uh, uh, groups that you like close uh, close groups to, and just trying to get over the, the rhetoric. Um, and uh, I suppose what I'd like to do is um, suggest that organising in uh, in groups of uh, like uh, language groups, say you know, um, say myself as like an English uh, English French, uh, and also 
uh, trying to speak to uh, semi-friendly groups, groups that you're already part of, uh, that say for example, um, with, uh, with anarchists uh, that have actually been seriously, seriously uh, co-opted, um, in, my, in my opinion. But there are still some that are willing, not, uh, sorry, that are still willing to... Uh, there are honest and curious people around. Absolutely, that, that's absolutely. true. There are some people who are entrenched that we're not really going to um, shift. Um, yes. oh, um, I just wanted to, it's been on my mind, someone made a comment that um, the protests ended the Vietnam War, and I don't think that that's true. I think Vietnam War ended because the Viet Cong went into Saigon and hence the US military basically surrendered. So I think that educating people is one part of it, um, but the other part of it is actually affecting change and doing something, doing something tangible. If you remember during the Iraq War, in the UK there was millions of people protesting against the start of that war. Australia, the number of protests were huge. Relatively speaking, the number of protests in, in, in uh, Australia over the Syrian war has been really small. So, I feel like it's just not enough. Like, we can't inform everybody the... the, the I'm not saying we should give up. We should definitely keep pressure, um, bring out as much, like, resist the false narrative of the mainstream media as much as possible, make our voices heard as much as possible, keep doing what we're doing, Organize. I'm not very good at organizing, but we need to think about what else to do. Something new, something different, because everything that's been tried and tested has failed, and we, we need something new. I don't know what that is, but anyway. Can I suggest that we, we move into some more practical suggestions, because I don't want to take up everyone's time. Let's resolve this in, in 10 or 15 minutes. Besides social media, I recommend uh, Talkback radio stations to get in touch with them. Uh, that's a very good source of uh, spreading the, uh, the cause of this activity. Uh, to GV, to UE, uh, radio stations. Yes. Yeah. Thanks, Mel. No. 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 Yeah, the, the only issue with that, I've, I've tried, believe me, a number of times. Mr. Yeah. Hadley uh, has his video <laughs> no. on the video. Yeah. 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 So I the problem I is, yeah, they, 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 and, and they get to know if you are going to do that, and I, I don't know, just yeah. change your name every time you call. <laughs> <laughs> believe me. I can, I can recommend some of the Lebanese experience on this, despite the fact that we are not very, like, professional and a lot of experiences, but uh, the Lebanese experience uh, is, is basically uh, a brief case of going into community halls. For example, if someone wants to make a project in Lebanon, especially in the areas where uh, uh, smaller groups, live, for example in villages, they uh, organize like uh, community hall uh, meetings or, uh, for example, be, uh, Belgradi, for example, if you have municipality elections, you would gather the people, you would uh, rally for the event, tell them, well, we have someone important coming to speak, so bring a figure, a very important figure for this community and tell them that we are going to talk about this, we want to hear about what you have to say. So going to local communities, bringing someone influential for them and making certain gatherings and talks. Thanks. I think in Arab society they, they, might work. they, look, at, they look at very important people a little bit more than in Australian society. <laughs> <laughs> um, someone was else? Yeah. 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 Sorry, um, I was a bad ear. Um, yeah, I think I, I heard uh, from throughout, uh, you know, kind of um, being here yesterday and today that self determination of the Syrian people comes strongly out. So, making a statement of this conference, I suppose, on this self determination of, of, that we support the self determination of the Syrian people. And, and that came out of the Syrian crisis. The other one it is the condemnation of the colonial media. I mean, we kind of came out, the, you know, strongly the, the, the representations on, on the media lies and uh, the false uh, interpretation of events that are selling us lies. So I mean, a condemnation of the Syrian of the corporate media lies. Um, and also, I suppose, I don't know to what extent everyone wants to endorse us next Sunday rally. And maybe something like also making representations to our politicians. Okay, so there's some suggestions for a 
uh, resolution of the conference, which I've noted. Um, Um, a little idea which is maybe slightly tongue-in-cheek, um, it's a bit of a joke, but hopefully there's something there, you know, maybe underlying that we can do, I don't know how it would work exactly. But the reason I heard about this conference and the reason I'm here was because I read a smear article on Tim in, <laughs> in, the, in the AFR, Australian Financial Review, last week. And it was, yeah, um, I don't know if you'd be able to track down last Tuesday's copy of the AFR. And it was saying, yeah, it was saying, um, yeah, I mean, all about how the University of Sydney standing by this controversial <laughs> lecturer, yeah, yeah, senior yeah, lecturer. Actually, but no, Sorry? That's good. They get more credit than they deserve. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, um, and I've heard your name because I've read globalresearch.ca and seen interviews with you, and I thought, um, let's go along and see what it's like because. Um, yeah, thank you. Yeah. For, for so free advertising from the AFR. Exactly. <laughs> try, um, That's what they said to me. Yeah. Most people who read the AFR haven't turned up. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, yeah. So I want to talk about an idea of how to get word out there um, and just kind of trace back the general thought process that happens when you spend time around a lot of the people you see in this room. Uh, and I find that three things happen always in the same order. Firstly, is you learn so much you don't even realize how much you've learned about things which aren't part of the typical uh, mainstream narrative that, that is given to us. Um, the sorts of things you can only find in independent media. And then the second thing is that you start to realize how little you actually know about the conflict and, and the way that the world works. The third thing that comes up is you get a the massive anxiety, you realize how much you didn't know, and then you think, shit, I shouldn't talk out because I feel anxious about how little I know. And just by being in this room at this conference, even the person here who has paid the least attention will know at the very least that, for example, Saudi Arabia is involved, or that Assad was elected democratically. These are not things that reach the mainstream narrative. And so even if you have spent two minutes in this room, you know so much more than the average person on Syria knows. So don't let that anxiety sink in about not knowing enough and just speak out and constantly be aware of how little actually reaches the average person. Um, I'd just like to agree with him because I have only recently um, come in contact with your names through uh, social media. Um, so for me, I'm not an academic or any of these things, but what he was saying, being in this room with all these people and hearing all the ideas, and that it gives me, myself, more confidence to speak to people and friends about what I've already read and understood, and so there's a whole, it's nice to know there's a big family. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to congratulate everybody for doing such an amazing job, considering everything that I've been seeing in the past with regards to tragedies which have been happening. Just as far as getting it out there, just a panel of two of you on a Q&A or a Jenny Brocky, you tear them to shreds. Yeah. Seriously. It's just in the past, we just <laughs> have never been represented by a proper English-speaking people. And so, and so everything is just turned into this blah, blah, blah mess yeah. at the end of it. But everybody speaking here, the clarity in it, the content in it, amazing. Congratulations. And that's what you have to do. You have to penetrate the mainstream media. Go um, on Facebook. Yeah, well, you know. <laughs> Everyone else is these yeah, days. Because yeah. they do not have a leg to stand on at the end of the day. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Listen, I want to um, put up some motions. Um, the first one from Marlene that uh, this conference supports the self determination of the Syrian people and that, that the, the Syria is for the people of Syria to, deter to determine. What do people think about that? Anyone against it? 
Thank you. Um, the second one, this conference calls on the Australian government to withdraw all military presence and action in Syria without request from or permission from the Syrian government. Anyone okay. support it? Anyone against it? Thank you. The third one, you might like to pick up something else here. This conference demands the Australian government drops all economic sanctions on Syria, which only exacerbate the suffering of the Syrian people. Well, support? Sorry. Thank you. People want against? It's like the Labour Party. <laughs> <laughs> um, that we call on the corporate and state media to simply tell the truth about Syria. Yeah. <laughs> Anything else? Not anymore. Yeah, we call on the government to sack itself and I'll take over. <laughs> Any other proposals? Yeah. Not in terms of this, but how do we stay connected with each other? How? Yeah. What about the next conference? I mean, I, yeah. I'm, I'm passing around an email list, but these days with so, social media as it is, maybe it would be better to have uh, a larger Facebook group of we have hands of Syria. However, that's used to distribute. Um, news, that's a page. Yes. Well, this is just a, the Center for Counter Hegemonic Studies is a thing that we created just to have a virtual library, a virtual library on literature, you know, like a research center. We're going to exchange with other people. So it's to, to put on academic things and links to media. It's a resource site basically, just online. So um, we could we have a we have a, a, a social media event for this conference. Uh, do you mean we could share, or we should create a new one, or, or what do you suggest? Well, a page, um, a page you would use to put uh, news or reports on, and people would see. But a group is used for people to uh, network and engage and stay connected and plan and organize things. And find the hashtag. But, but there is a word. Yeah, yeah. you can even <laughs> do it through Twitter and create a hashtag to remain connected. But face, face, like a larger Facebook group where we can network um, and it can be like by invitation if you wish but but it should be sort of visible it shouldn't be secret it should be visible people for, public, yeah. for the like public a, would you like a group or a page which is specific to this conference to this to sydney or to australia for example? perhaps we should because make hands it, of yeah. is an international one that's really to do with news about syria but you're talking about something more to inform people about local things or what? exactly something to organize with something yeah. like Maybe a page for the conference. So like for the next, yeah. I can make a page for the conference, um, and maybe we can post it on the event page or the website. And everyone can. Yeah, and then like it. exactly, and if, if there's future conferences, you'll be aware of it through that site. We have a volunteer for that one. Thank you. Excuse me. There is already a, a group. Um, they like uh, hands off Syria. There's a group hands off Syria. Yeah. Yeah. It's a page. Yeah, they like. So most people here. Can I just have a show of hands of who's already a member of that group? Of, uh, Sydney hands off Syria. Not that many, but I've met a couple of people here. It's a big group. It's, it's really a news site. It's a magazine site with information coming through every day, not so much organising. But did, Mimi, did you want to create one like that and link it to the group? I can do that. So, so we have an offer there. What will you call it? I'll, I'll, I'll call it, well, actually, um, what do you guys want it to be called? Do you want it to be called... Um, the uh, caucus for counter hegemony. Simple. Um, ooh, simple. Well, keep it simple. Syrian sovereignty. Uh, yeah. Aus Australians for sovereignty or Australians. <laughs> we can work it out later. Australians for yeah. Syria. Yeah. The name is not important. I'm not, I'm not sure. You guys tell me. Australians. I like that one. Australians for Syrian sovereignty. Yeah. Yeah. But what about Yemen? What about um, yeah. Palestine? <laughs> I'll leave it up to Tim, please. Okay, we'll, we'll advertise on the event page for this conference. Anyone have anything else to say? Thank you very much for coming along, folks. We really valued your participation. <laughs> Thank you.